Okay, so I do have one o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started. This will be uh, a pretty lengthy presentation, uh, and so I want to make sure we have time to get through it and also take your questions. So um, I'll go ahead and get started with some opening remarks, and then we'll get to the presentation. Um, so I want to say good afternoon to everyone, and thank you all for joining us today for our first CNS listening session. I'm Laura Klebanski, and I'll be your host today. So before I jump into our topic, um, I do have a couple of tips for uh, troubleshooting the WebEx problems. So if you are, or even if you begin to have issues with WebEx um, during the presentation, um, including any audio issues, not being able to hear um, or see things, uh, we have found that leaving the meeting and then re-entering usually uh, resolves those. However, if that doesn't work for you, you may also try connecting via the meeting uh, connecting to the meeting via the phone number, which can be found under the WebEx link on the website. So, okay, with that, I'll move on to today's topic, which is a presentation of Amendment 3 to the Southern Flounder Fishery Management Plan. And that's gonna be presented by Mike Leffler and Ann Marquis. And as I said earlier, this is uh, our first BMF listening session. And the purpose of these is to provide an opportunity for us, the division, to present the fishery management plan to the public in a low pressure setting where you have the opportunity to ask questions about the plan itself. So hopefully the outcome of this public, uh, the outcome of this is that the public feels better informed um, as they prepare comments for the advisory committees and the commission. So the public comment period for Southern Flounder Amendment 2, or excuse me, Amendment 3 is currently open. The advisory committees are all scheduled to review uh, the plan and provide input on that plan, which will then be um, submitted to the commission. So I wanna clarify that today is not a public comment opportunity, but instead is a learning and engagement opportunity. So after today's listening session, if you would like to provide public comment to the Marine Fisheries Commission or any of the advisory committees, you may do that as described on the division's website. And you are welcome to contact me in the commission office um, for any information that you may need and how to do that as well. Okay, so following the presentation today, we will be taking questions from the attendees and we're gonna be using the WebEx chat feature. So I think some of you heard me mention this before. Um, if you'll look at your WebEx screen, you should see a chat button uh, on the bottom right-hand corner of your WebEx window. If you click on that, it should open a chat window on the right-hand side of your screen. And you can enter questions into that chat window at any point during the presentation or after. Um, and please be sure when you do submit your question that you submit it to all panelists. You should see a drop-down box next to the two prompts. So um, you'll submit those. And once Ann and Mike have finished their presentation, I will read out those questions so everyone can hear them. Um, in the order they're received. Um, and I'll review this again after the presentation, but for now, um, I'll hand it over to Mike and Ann. Thanks, Laura. So hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Good afternoon. Thank you all for attending. And uh, as Laura mentioned, this is our first virtual information meeting about a division fishery management plan. So very excited about this process. For those of you joining us who don't know who we are, I'm Michael Leffler, the lead Southern Founder Biologist for the division. And also with us is Ann Markwith, and she's the co-lead for the Southern Founder Fishery Management Plan with me. So as Laura mentioned, the purpose of this, of this meeting is to provide you with background information that's pertinent um, to the development of Amendment 3 to the Southern Founder Fishery Management Plan. This informational meeting is being recorded and will be provided to each member of the Northern, Southern, and FinFish Advisory Committees, so they can all hear the same presentations and answers to the questions that y'all have for us this afternoon. And this will allow the advisory committee members more time to devote to discussing the draft FMP during their upcoming meetings next week. So today, Ann and I will be taking turns walking you through the fishery management plan. Uh, we'll be presenting an overview of draft amendment three We'll begin with a timeline of where we are in the FMP process. We'll provide you information about the background of the FMP. We'll then get into the division's initial recommendations. And finally, we'll get into um, Amendment 3 components, including an overview um, and details of what issue papers are included to inform management 
of the southern founder in the future. So looking at this timeline, we're here at the step where we provide the overview of the full draft amendment to the standing and regional MFC advisory committees. The Southern Flounder FMP advisory committee assisted the division in drafting the amendment and the MFC approved this to be sent to, uh, to send the draft to the advisory committees and the public for review. Public comment is open and in January and ends January 14th. We're not accepting public comment today though. Only questions will be accepting um, We'll be accepting public comment at each of the advisory committee meetings on January 11th, 12th, and 13th. In addition, the public can submit written comments through the US mail and through our online questionnaire. For a quick review to remind us all why we're developing Amendment 3, it's important to note that the Southern Flounder stock is overfished, and overfishing was occurring during the terminal year of the stock assessment, which was 2017. The terminal year is important as it is what all management reductions and projections are based on. We have made strides in ending overfishing and are beginning to rebuild the stock since this terminal year through the actions of Amendment 2, which we'll get into as we go through this presentation. And as you can see on this slide, I'll reference the figure on the left. This is fishing mortality, the rate of removals from both the commercial and recreational sectors. And you can see that that terminal year is above the solid line and the dash line, which means we're overfishing. The intent of Amendment 3 is to reduce the rate of removals to below the threshold, which is the solid line, and ultimately to the target to near the dash line. And conversely, on the right slide, or the right-hand figure, this is the spawn and stock biomass, so this is the adult mature females. And you can see that the terminal year value is below the um, threshold line, which is the solid horizontal line. And the intent of Amendment 3 is to rebuild the stock, and that would get this SSB value above the solid line and closer to the dashed line. Since the Southern Flounder stock is overfished and overfishing is occurring, the question becomes what needs to be done to rebuild the Southern Flounder stock? This requires us to reduce fishing mortality and increase spawning stock biomass by reducing the coastwide total removals. Total removals are landings and dead discards combined, and the reductions are based on the 2017 fishing mortality values, the terminal year of the stock assessment. To do this, we use projections to understand how spawning stock biomass should respond to changes in fishing mortality with assumptions centered around recruitment. And this means that we looked at prior levels of recruitment at various stock sizes in history to estimate how recruitment may respond as the SSB increases. It is also important to remind everyone that since North Carolina has no jurisdiction outside our waters, the volume of reductions we presented for the North Carolina portion of the Southern Founder stock. And as you can see in this figure, the North Carolina portion of the stock, of, of course, is the Northeast portion of these highlighted cells. And the stock unit for the stock assessment that we're included in is the states of North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. And yes, this purple line does designate the difference between the Gulf states stock, but they also have a Southern Flounder stock, which is genetically different than our South Atlantic stock. Results from the stock assessment indicated we needed a minimum of a 31% reduction to end overfishing in two years, and a minimum of a 52% reduction to rebuild spawning stock biomass and end the overfish status in 10 years. However, a greater reduction was recommended by the division and approved by the MFC due to uncertainty around actions of the other states and the timing of the implementation of Amendment 2. In August of 2019, the Marine Fisheries Commission approved Amendment 2 that included 62% reductions in total removals in 2019, and beginning in 2020, a 72% reduction in total removals. These levels of reductions were greater than those statutory required, and are more conservative by trying to achieve a larger reduction to help offset some uncertainty. Additional information on this topic can be found on page three of the decision document that hopefully all of you have seen. Upon adoption of Amendment 2, which included using seasons to constrain harvest, the Marine Fisheries Commission also approved the division to continue developing Amendment 3 with more robust and long-term management strategies and measures. Under Amendment 2, reduction in harvest has occurred, 
and hopefully has the desired impact of beginning to rebuild the spawning stock biomass. It must be noted here that because of the timing of implementation of Amendment 2, we were clear that it would be unlikely to meet the 2019 reduction level, and so it was recommended to attempt to achieve a larger reduction than required to offset the limited reductions the first year. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Ann Markworth, the co-lead, and she'll provide you some background information on Amendment 3. Thank you, Mike. Moving forward in the development of Amendment 3, all options are based on the 72% reduction that began in 2020. This slide provides a little background about why a 72% reduction was and is important. This reduction provides a buffer to minimize risk and increases the probability of successfully rebuilding the stock. Projections assumed all states would implement management, but there were uncertainties around if and when those management actions would occur. This figure shows the anticipated increases in abundance in metric tons as shown on the left axis for a 72% reduction based on assumptions around stock recruitment and the reduced rate of fishing mortality. The red line indicates the 10 year deadline for rebuilding. The solid horizontal line is the minimum for rebuilding and the dashed horizontal line is what management actions are trying to achieve. Like North Carolina, South Carolina and Florida have implemented new flounder regulations since the completion of the coastwide stock assessment. This table shows the current regulations in the states to our south. Florida's new regulations include an increase in minimum size limit from 12 to 14 inches, a reduction in bag limit from 10 fish to 5 fish per person per day, commercial trip limits, and a recreational close season from October 15th through November 30th, a time associated with peak migration of flounder. South Carolina regulations include increasing the minimum size limit from 15 to 16 inches, changes to the bag limit similar to Florida, and developing a stocking program for Southern Flounder. Regulations for Florida and South Carolina are very new, only going into effect in the early and mid-2021. In February 2020, the MFC approved the goal and objectives for Draft Amendment 3. The goal is to achieve a self-sustaining population. To achieve that goal, the objectives are to encourage interjurisdictional management strategies, address habitat and environmental quality that directly impacts southern flounder, monitor and manage the fishery and ecosystem impacts, promote stewardship of the resource, and promote habitat protections consistent with the Coastal Habitat Protection Plan. These can also be found in the decision document and on page two of the draft FMP. While Amendment 3 contains all the same information as previous FMPs, this document reflects changes to the FMP process and document with a focus on management of the species. The Amendment 3 document is available on the Southern Flounder Hot Topics page on the division website for you to review and contains information that is essentially divided into three areas. The first is a decision document that summarizes the division's initial recommendations and provides some rationale for those decisions. The next is the body of the FMP, which outlines all the background and research recommendations about Southern Flounder. The final piece of the FMP are the appendices, which include the issue papers that detail options for managing Southern Flounder fisheries. The document can be found on the division's website identified under the image on the slide. Seven issue papers have been developed for inclusion in draft amendment three. Starting with the first four, these include sustainable harvest, which was based on commercial and recreational allocations determined by the MFC in March 2021, and includes quota management and includes quota management. Increased recreational access, which investigates the possibility of creating a recreational fishery for oscillated flounder, inlet corridors, which evaluate inlet corridors as a management tool for conservation of southern flounder and adaptive management, which develops the infrastructure that outlines direct changes to the management in the Southern Flounder fishery. As a building block for our discussion, we will review the initial division recommendations. It is important to note here that these initial division recommendations are just that, initial. The division will review the AC and public comments and may reconsider its recommendations. The initial recommendations are based on the science and the impact to the stock. 
to start with sustainable harvest, the division's initial recommendations are to select a commercial quota with daily quota monitoring, maintaining the 72% reduction and keeping the current sub allocation for pound rents. A recreational quota managed through a season within the August 16th through September 30th window, approving accountability measures for both sectors by applying paybacks for any overages, implement commercial trip limits for pound nets and gigs only where appropriate, reduce the recreational fishery bag limit to one fish per person per day, and to not allow harvest of southern flounder using ruffle. For increased access, um, for the increased access issue paper, the vision's initial recommendation is to allow a one fish bag limit of oscillated flounder in an early season from March 1 through April 15th for hook and line gear in the ocean only. For the inlet quarter issue paper, the division does not support using inlet quarters as a management tool for southern flounder at this time. And finally, for the adaptive management issue paper, the division's initial recommendation is to develop an adaptive management framework for Amendment 3. Moving on to the next three issue papers, the sector allocation issue paper was presented and the MFC have already voted to approve sector allocations. The slot limit issue paper investigates the utility of slot limits in the recreational southern flounder fishery. And finally, the phasing out of large mesh gill nets issue paper provides information on eliminating large mesh gill nets from harvesting southern flounder by the end of the current ITP, which is August 2023. The division's recommendation for slot limits is to not impl implement slot limits at this time and maintain the current minimum size of 15 inches. Currently, the division does not have a recommendation for phasing out large mesh gill nets as we want to review AC and public comment prior to making an initial recommendation. And with that, Mike will now start walking you through these issue papers. Thank you, Ann. So now that we've introduced each issue paper and the division's initial recommendations, we're going to take some time to walk through each issue paper and provide some background as well as some of the rationale for our recommendations. With the exception of the sector allocation issue paper, we'll be walking through the issue papers, how they are laid out and the draft fishery management plan. But here we'll be starting with the fifth issue paper as the MFC has already acted on this issue. The sector allocation issue paper, which is appendix 4.5, outlines the decisions by the Marine Fisheries Commission on this issue that have guided the development of the other issue papers. At a March 2021 special meeting, the MFC approved a motion to adjust the allocations for Amendment 3 to 70% commercial, 30% recreational in 2021, and 2022 to 60% commercial and 40% recreational in 2023, and to achieve a 50-50 parity in allocation beginning in 2024. This is important as this directly guides the sustainable harvest issue paper and impacts the increased recreational access paper as well. The next issue paper that we'll be reviewing today is the Sustainable Harvest Issue Paper. This is Appendix 4.1 in the FMP. This paper contains many of the management measures that are being considered for Southern Flounder and will make up the bulk of our presentation today. The five main topics that are covered in this paper are quota management for both the commercial and recreational sectors and all that is involved with implementing a quota, trip limits for the commercial sector, We'll discuss bag limits for the recreational sector. And finally, the recreational commercial gear license holders. To begin the presentation on quotas, we wanted to start with a brief discussion on the topic of total allowable landings or TAL and total allowable catch or TAC. The difference between these two concepts is that the estimated dead discards are added to the total allowable landings which creates the TAC. This TAC value is ultimately what is managed for each fishery and will dictate if there are paybacks for an individual sector. We do not manage the fisheries in real time to the TAC because the estimates of debt discards are not available until after the season is complete. The first and main topic of the issue paper is developing a quota for the Southern Founder fishery. A quota is a harvest value that, if met, causes a closure of the fishery for a 
particular species for here, southern flounder. So we're showing a figure that breaks out the fisheries across the four southern states that make up the southern flounder stock prior to implementing Amendment 2. And you can see the left of the pie graph is recreational harvest, and the right of the pie graph is the commercial harvest. So here we're breaking out the North Carolina fisheries. Of the pieces in this figure, it's the commercial and the recreational harvest and dead discards that are being managed for the quota. The other piece of this that is of utmost importance, which is the largest piece of this figure, is the escapement piece. And escapement are the fish that could have been harvested, but were not. Escapement is estimated to increase each year above and beyond what escapement was during 2017. It is these fish that contribute to the spawning stock, reproduce, and create the future generations of southern flounder that will recover this important stock. Under sustainable harvest, there are multiple decisions, including how gears are divided, what areas are allowed to be fished for each gear combination, and finally seasons that gears and areas are open. For example, this figure shows possible decisions for both the commercial and recreational fisheries. If we look at the commercial piece circled in orange, you'll see a potential to divide the commercial fishery into two gear components, with pound nets being further divided into three management areas and mobile gears being divided into two management areas. And finally, with both gears and area combinations being allowed over differing seasons. Please keep in mind as we go through the quota slides that the values we are focusing on are landings. The first thing we considered was dividing the commercial allocation by gear. Here we show how the gears can be divided between two categories, pound nets and the second category that we term mobile gears, which contains all other gears that land southern flounder. And the values that you see next to these pie graphs would be the estimated harvest allowed for their quota period. In addition to separating suballocations based on gear types, the suballocation for each sector may influence the feasibility of managing a commercial quota. The division has three ways to adjust suballocations. The first way was to look at the historical landings from each category identified. The second was to look at keeping the commercial pound net fishery allocation at the same level it is currently. And the final was to look at dividing the commercial gill net allocations evenly across the mobile gear categories and the pound nets. This last option is considered as the Marine Fishery Commission tasked the division with developing an issue paper with the option of eliminating the commercial anchored large mesh gill net fishery for southern flounder. It is also important to emphasize here that the overall commercial allocation will be shifting in the coming years from 70% in 2022 to 60% in 2023 and down to 50% beginning in 2024. All of the landings values presented in this presentation are based on the 70-30 allocation. Once the gear categories have been identified, then areas for each of the fisheries can be considered. The division examined multiple areas for each fishery to determine the best way to divide each gear in discrete manageable areas. In this example, the mobile gears can be divided into two areas at the BD boundary line identified in the sea turtle and Atlantic sturgeon incidental take permits or ITPs. This was used as it is a known boundary for many commercial fishermen. Here is an example of how the pound net gear can be split up. In this example, we use the same boundary lines identified under Amendment 2. These boundary lines represent three distinct areas where harvest of southern flounder occurs using pound nets and tries to accommodate the migration behavior and the timing of the movements during the fall migrations. There are certainly other options for each gear combination that we'll touch on slightly at the end of the quota section of this presentation. So after identifying gear and areas, the next step is to identify seasons or time of year the fisheries can operate. Here, what we're looking at is not identifying a fixed season, but a date when the fishery begins. 
This is because it will be the quota monitoring that determines when a fishery will close. There can be flexibility here as we can identify multiple seasons within a gear category or within areas like we have in Amendment 2. So, for instance, we could allow gigs to operate in the late spring or early summer and allow the other gears to operate later in the fall. So, let me show you how this could work. So, in this figure, each of these green arrows at the bottom is a month beginning with January and extending to December. And you can see the blue, the orange, and the purple highlights kind of give you a representation of the months that the fisheries could operate. So, in this example, it allows the most flexibility among users. The purpose is to have a fall fish. This proposes to have a fall fishery for the pound net gear as is traditional and the starting for dates for each area can be slightly different. This outlines the possibility to allow for some of the mobile gear allocation to be harvested by non gill net gear during a late spring and early summer window to allow maximizing of price and for gears like gigs. This is a time when the weather is more favorable for that particular fishery. The division would monitor this opening through daily monitoring, just like the other fisheries, and close it when the quota is approached. Gill nets are not selected to be included in this early summer fishery as hot water temperatures increase dead discards, unmarketable target species due to damage caused while fish are entangled, the potential for protected species interactions, and finally, because some areas of the state cannot open a gill net fishery this time of year due to protected species and incidental take permits. So what is quota monitoring? So quota monitoring is a very important aspect to developing a quota. The success of the quota depends on the division's ability to monitor the quota accurately and to close fisheries when the allocation is approached. This is important and impacts decisions about how many gear combinations and how many areas to allow in a fishery. The more complex the fishery, the more difficult it is to monitor and to keep the landings below the total allowable landings that we discussed earlier. And in addition, the more divided the fisheries, the more potential there is for fishers to alter their behavior and participate in fisheries they had not participated in in prior years. So now that we've walked through the commercial quota, I'm going to return back to Ann for the recreational quota piece. Thanks, Mike. So now that we've discussed the commercial piece, we will switch gears and focus on the recreational fishery and quota development. As with the commercial fishery, you'll notice that multiple options were considered as indicated by the orange circle. Like the commercial fishery, we also looked at the recreational total allowable landings by gear. There is one caveat with splitting the recreational allocation by gear. Harvest from recreational commercial gear licenses, or RUCL, is not included here as there are no estimates of landings and no way to currently monitor the ruckle with fishery. We will touch on how to handle ruckle later on in this presentation. With the recreational fishery, since we aren't able to do daily monitoring through MRIP, the fishery could be constrained to a single area statewide seasonal approach. The issue paper offers several seasonal options as seen in the table, including the August 16th to September 30th season from Amendment 2, for the hook and line fishery. As you can see, season was analyzed at varying bag limits. The effective bag limits on the total allowable landings will be discussed later on in the presentation. Likewise, there are options for different seasons presented for the gig fishery. However, to keep from undermining the success of achieving the needed reductions, the gig fishery should be held to the same season as the hook and line fishery in order to avoid shifts in behavior and potentially exceeding the total allowable landings by having separate seasons for each gear. The green oval on the figure shows the approximate timing of the season identified under Amendment 2. The August 16th through September 30th season provides access to a fishery when the species is abundant, but also allows a fishery that can operate and stay within the total allowable landings. If the season is moved earlier in the year, harvest is greater than allowed. It is important to note here that MRIP estimates are what we use to determine seasons. For Southern Flounder, we have deconstructed the MRIP estimates into two week intervals from the normal two month waves. This increases associated error around the estimates and also impacts seasonal dates as we can't make estimates at a finer scale. 
for example, at a daily or weekly level. Now that we are finishing up on the quota portion of the presentation, it is important to point out that for the recreational fishery, the quota discussion is one of three parts of a successful recreational fishery. This is a figure that you will become familiar with during this presentation. The quota or season can be impacted by what bag limits are set at, and in turn, how quota and bag limits interact can determine what increased access looks like. The severity of the reduction needed to rebuild southern flounder and the dynamics of the fishery mean that there are three management that these three management measures all interact with a very small sweet spot marked by the star that allows for an equilibrium between the three measures where all things are possible. This sweet spot is only attainable if everything lines up exactly right, which is why some options for the various measures are presented as they are. We will be discussing bag limits and increased recreational access later and how all three of those items will influence the decision impacting the recreational fishery. Accountability measures should apply to both the commercial and recreational fisheries. To determine if we exceed the TAC for either sector, we review the total allowable landings that occurred during the fishery, then estimate the dead discards that were a result of that fishery and add them together. If the sum of the landings and the dead discards are less than the total allowable catch, then accountability measures will not be applied. If the sum of the landings and the dead discards are greater than the total allowable catch, then the tack was exceeded and accountability measures will be applied appropriately. We just walked you through an example of how allocations could work, but there are several op other options in the paper. While the data was initially analyzed for a variety of scenarios, the more complex scenarios make managing the total allowable landings more difficult. We are looking at a large reduction in landings and this value can only be broken down so much. The options identified in the issue paper have the best chance for monitoring and rebuilding. These are the options seen on the slide now are the options for the commercial quota and the various area combinations. Those highlighted in dark gray are the division's initial recommendations at this time. The two areas for mobile gears and three areas for pound nets provide flexibility for the fishery while using known boundary lines or natural breaks in effort and landings. These options can be found on page five of the decision document with further rationale for the initial recommendation detailed on page six of the decision document. Option two or the sub allocation options for the commercial fishery, as well as option three, the recreational fishery quota are presented on this slide. The division's initial recommendation is to keep the current sub allocation for pound nets, as this fishery may not be viable below the current total allowable landings and could become difficult to monitor at a 50 50 parity compared to the other options. For the recreational fishery, the division recommends a single statewide recreational season during the August 16th to September 30th window. A single season allows for the best chance of achieving the needed reductions. As a reminder, accountability measures will be applied to both sectors for paybacks of any overages. Information on both options can be found on page six of the decision documents. And now I'll turn it back over to Mike to talk about commercial trip limits. Thank you, Ann. So trip limits are a tool that are used to help control the effort in the commercial fishery, so not to exceed the total allowable landings. So uh, essentially a trip limit is a quota um, that each fisher or vessel is allowed to catch per trip out to sea, you know, the sound or the rivers. Um, it's not necessarily appropriate for all gears. For example, they may be useful to help maintain the total allowable landings with gigs and pound nets, but not gill nets due to the differences in discard mortality. Additionally, for trip limits, the currency or how we set the trip or the limits for the trip may vary between gears. It could be set in pounds or numbers of fish, depending on which gear they're applied to. And normally trip limits are applied to the entire season. And these could also be applied after the fishery closes initially when we approach the quota value and be used as a way to reopen without exceeding the total allowable landings. So what I mean by that is if we had a quota of 100,000 pounds, and we close the fishery at 80,000 pounds, 
we could harvest an additional 20,000 pounds to meet the total allowable landings. Then we may choose to do that under regulated trip limits to increase our or decrease our chances of exceeding the total allowable landings. Presented here is a heat map, and the colors are representative of the percent of proposed total allowable landings landed on a given day for a particular year for the pound net fishery in the northern area of the state. We're using this as an example. The darker the orange red color, the higher the percent of the tax total allowable landings was landed. And the greener the color, the lower the landings, in which some cases are zero. And this is just a small part of a much larger data set showing the first two weeks in October for the last 10 years for the northern area pond nut fishery. But we're, what we're getting at is the fact that landings are very variable from day to day and from year to year. And similar variation occurs for the central and the southern areas. What this is saying is that the large volume of harvest can happen daily with no trip limits. So theoretically, as the stock rebuilds, these higher landings values could occur more often under not just in season, but when the fishery or if the fishery is reopened as well. This is important because the assumption is that if we're able to reopen the fishery, trip limits would ramp would tamp back this volume depending on the number of participants, the available landings, and what the trip limits are set at. So trip limits need to be carefully thought out as reopening windows could be shorter and as the stock rebuilds and the higher the trip limit, the more potential for overages of the total allowable landings. It's also important to note that effort in the pound net fishery is not comparable today to what it was prior to implementation of Amendment 2 in 2019. So there's many participants in the pound net fishery that have chosen not to set the full complement of nets and many have not decided to, have decided to not set any nets at all. And this means that both the number of participants and the number of active nets are lower than in previous years. So the point of that statement is, you know, as we go through these fisheries, we're going to use the most up-to-date information, number of participants as it's come through the quota monitoring to determine what an appropriate trip limit would be for the different gear combinations that we set. This idea of what an appropriate trip limit would be gets at the amount of risk in terms of potentially exceeding the total allowable landings. Shown here are the averages from September through November from 2008 through 2017 in the northern area only. And you can see that the majority of trips land less than 250 pounds, but when the weather is right and the fish move, single trips can harvest over 4,000 pounds. And if the quota for the pound net fishery is close to being met and the fishery closes, and then the division determines that the fishery could reopen under trip limits, the higher the trip limit that's set increases the potential to exceed the total allowable landings. And this becomes a balancing act of risk of exceeding the quota versus what the industry can handle to make setting the gear and the trip worth it. And for example, for the gig fishery, it may be more prudent to look at trip limits and numbers of fish rather than in pounds. So using a pound system for gigs could create additional discards as the gig fishery has an assumed discard mortality rate of 100%. Because of this, it makes sense to identify a number not to exceed rather than a poundage. In the commercial gig fishery, you can see that 90% of the trips harvest 50 or 50 fish or less. There are three options for trip limits that have been identified. And these options can be found on page seven of the decision document. The division initially recommends trip limits for pound nets and gigs upon reopening after reaching a closure threshold. So if there's remaining quota after the fishery is closed, then if the, that remaining quota could be harvested using trip limits. These trip limits allow the fishery to maximize the available allocation, but would not be static as the available remaining quota would determine what the trip limit would be set at. And now we'll turn it back over to Ann for discussion on bag limits. Thanks, Mike. So bag limits are the number of species that a person can legally take in a day or a trip. A recreational bag limit is the recreational equivalent of a commercial trip limit. A bag limit is static and is appropriate for and can be applied to all gears, including the ruffle gears. Although we do not have estimates of impacts of changes in bag limits on the ruffle or gig fisheries, 
the bag limit should be the same across all recreational gears. We want to take a second to quickly walk you through why we are looking at bag limit changes. Even though we are at historic lows, as indicated by the red circle on the figure on the left, as abundance increases, shown by the figure on the right, there will be many more fish available to harvest, so angler success may need to be controlled to limit harvest as the stock increases. At this time, we cannot monitor the recreational fishery in real time like we can the commercial fishery, and it may be prudent to reduce the recreational bag limit to constrain harvest while rebuilding occurs. This is especially important when thinking about applying accountability measures for overages that could occur. The concerns about increased angler success are discussed in detail in the issue paper. Due to the concern about the current bag limit of four fish and the potential to exceed the total allowable landings, when looking at the various seasons for the recreational fishery, we analyze the effects of the potential bag limit options as well. As the bag limit decreases, the estimated impact on the total allowable landings is lessened. Looking at the recommended August 16th to September 30th season, there is approximately a 10,000 pound difference between the four fish and one fish bag limit. Please note that this analysis is done for the hook and line fishery only as we do not have the data for gigs or ruckle to take the data past the four fish bag limit. However, any changes to bag limits could be applied to all recreational harvest. This table shows the percent contribution of the different bag limits to total harvest for various seasons. If you look at the one fish bag limit column all the way to the right, it shows that the majority, currently the majority of anglers are landing one fish regardless of the proposed season, making it the unofficial bag limit. Looking specifically at the August 16th to September 30th season, 93% of anglers harvested only one fish, indicating why we can't afford a bag limit higher than one, especially when considering the landings from the past several years. As the population rebuilds, the chance of angler success increases. This figure shows that just increasing the current success from one to two fish means the total allowable landings will be exceeded for one, if not all recreational allocations. The horizontal lines on this figure represent the MFC approved allocations. Looking at the recommended August 16th to September 30th season, you can see increasing success by one fish means that the recreational fishery would exceed all the total allowable landings from 2024 forward. It is also important to remind you that if accountability measures are approved, are approved, if the tack is exceeded, then that means less harvest the following year. This figure shows the estimated pounds landed if there was no closure of the fishery, the landings that were estimated for an August 16th to September 30th season, and what the actual 2020 August 16th to September 30th seasonal landings were, compared to the various MFC approved allocations. The actual 2020 landings are the yellow bar all the way to the right, and the bag limit is currently for fish. Looking at the 2020 recreational landings data and comparing them to the estimates, you can see that angler behavior changed and success increased. In 2020, with a four fish bag limit, the quota was exceeded and would have been in future years, even with the approved increases to the total allowable landings. If we analyze the data for lower bag limits based on the catch rates from 2020, you can see that the lower bag limit constrains the increases in success more closely to the approved towels. Looking specifically at the 2020 landings, you can see that even with a two fish bag limit, the recreational hook and line fishery would have exceeded the target quotas illustrating our concern. So this brings us back to this figure. As you can see, bag limits are now colored teal as well as quote. What the bag limit is set at could dictate if and by how much the recreational sector may exceed their quota based on the season chosen. Lowering a bag limit could buffer that effect. The decision for the, these two management measures have the potential to impact any increased access in the ocean. And hopefully the full picture will become clear after the increased recreational access discussion.
The initial division recommendation is to reduce the recreational bag limit of flounder to one fish per person per day due to concerns over increased angler success with the hope that the one fish bag limit would buffer some of the overages. For further information on the options, it can be found on page seven of the decision document. And I will now turn it back over to Mike for a discussion on the ruffle fishery, as well as the increased recreational access issue paper. Thank you, Ann. So to finish out sustainable harvest, if you remember from the recreational quota slide, the one piece that couldn't be accounted for with the total allowable landings are the landings from the recreational commercial gear license users or ruffle gears. Uh, ruffle license holders primary land southern flounder by large mesh gill nets, though there is incidental catch from shrimp trawls and crab pots as well. The recreational use of select commercial gears is authorized by statute, but fishermen are restricted to the recreational bag limits when using this license. In addition, the recreational commercial gear license holder can only use gear when the gear is allowed for the commercial fishery. So, for example, if large mesh gill nets are not allowed for the commercial industry at a time, then the recreational commercial gear license holders also cannot use that gear. And landings have not been monitored since 2008. However, this figure does show the, the ruffle license holders in numbers, and you can see they're declining from about 6,200 in 2002 down to about 1,600 in 2017. So the number of participants has dropped considerably um, over the last 15 years or so. And so the division recommends not allowing the use of recreational commercial gear license to harvest flounder. The options and rationale can be found on page eight in the decision document. Now, this does not mean that recreational commercial gear license would not be able to use large mesh gill nets, but they could only use large mesh gill nets when they're allowed and they would not be able to use them to harvest flounder. So that finishes up um, sustainable harvest and we'll keep moving on. The next issue paper is the increased recreational access to flounder by allowing a season in the ocean for oscillated flounder. And this is appendix 4.2 in the fishery management plan. As everyone is aware, the regulations of flounder are such that they are managed as an aggregate of three species for the recreational fishery. They include summer flounder, gulf flounder, and of course, southern flounder. Because of this, the management of one species often impacts one or more of the other three flounder species. Summer flounder regulations implemented by the division through actions of the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission or the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Councils impact our southern flounder fishery and vice versa. However, for the species to be managed separately, the ability of anglers to differentiate between species is an absolute must. This will require educational outreach by the division, of course. And to determine exactly how good recreational anglers' ability is to differentiate between species, the Coastal Angling Program is doing some citizen science using an app they developed called Catch You Later. And since the study design concerning the use of this app will allow for the comparison of a trained and untrained groups, this will provide a statistically sound evaluation of the capability of proper identification of the public. The Catch You Later app is live and data are being submitted as we present this to you today. The issue paper looks at seasons outside of the fall season for an ocean only oscillated flounder fishery. Also, this would most likely be hook and line only and not gigs since it's hard for giggers and spear fishermen to ID what species of flounder is prior to harvest. And something to keep in mind are the estimated landings are not just of summer and gulf flounder during this early season, but those of southern flounder as well. And that is any landings of southern flounder in the early season will be accounted for and could impact the fall season and the remaining total allowable landings. There are some years that southern flounder can be up to 50% of the ocean landings on the recreational side. And so there's concern that the rebuilding of the southern flounder stock could be impacted by allowing access to these other flounder species. This is why in order to minimize risk, short early seasons with low bag limits are being considered 
but can be adjusted through adaptive management as information comes in on the ability of the anglers to ID the species and as the adjustments to allocations are implemented in the coming years. In addition, any changes to allow increased access to summer flounder will need to be approved by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission and the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council to make sure the harvest of summer flounder does not exceed their requirements. So I'd like to emphasize again on how quota, bag limits, and increased access all play together. So changes to one can have a massive impact on the other. For example, if a high bag limit were set, there may not be enough total allowable landage for the additional early season. And conversely, if the bag limit is lowered to maximize the quota, then there's availability to have the additional season. Trying to maximize everything will potentially cause the recreational sector to severely exceed the total allowable landage. This is why some of the options with these three issues are presented in the issue paper as they are, because they're aiming for the sweet spot where all three are at some sort of equilibrium, enough quota to have a large enough bag limit to also allow increased recreational access. And so for increased recreational access, there are two options for this issue paper that can be found on page eight and nine of the decision document. In order to minimize the risk, to the rebuilding effort of Southern Flounder, the division's initial recommendation is to allow one fish bag limit of oscillated flounder in an early season from March 1 through April 15 for hook and line gear in the ocean only. And that completes increased recreational access. And I'll turn it back to Ann to go through inlet corridor discussion. All right, so this brings us to the third issue paper, evaluating inlet corridors and their utility in southern flounder conservation and management. This is Appendix 4.3 to the FMP. Flounder life history utilizes inlets at different stages. In the fall, mature fish leave estuaries through the inlets as they move offshore to spawn, and then larvae come back in through the inlets late winter, early spring, and are at the mercy of the wind and the current. The interest in this management strategy is for the fall when the migrating southern flounder are moving through the inlet areas to the ocean. There is concern that the inlets act as bottlenecks to southern flounder, which may create areas of increased harvest. However, tagging data doesn't support the idea of a bottleneck, and once fish queue to leave, they move out quickly, nor does the tagging data indicate that which inlets are most used. Additional information on the use of inlets by Southern Flounder are being collected by several researchers at East Carolina University, UNCW, and by division staff. Information that is available from a New River telemetry tagging study conducted by Dr. Fred Scharf at UNCW shows insight into Southern Flounder migratory behavior. The fish stayed in a small area for a long time prior to their spawning migration, and once the fish began their migration, they left the estuary in a hurry, as shown by the figure. There are also existing regulations that function as inlet corridors already. The majority are through ITP closures around inlets that limit where gillnets can be set during the fall gillnet fishery. In addition, there are some areas that may act as de facto corridors for escapement, like the new blue blue crab spawning sanctuaries in the southern portion of the state. There are two main options for inlet corridors. If the option to implement inlet corridors is selected, there are two additional sub options to decide how specific to take regulations. Information on the options can be found on page nine of the decision document. The division's initial recommendation is to not use inlet corridors as a management tool at this time, as harvest closes before the peak migration, and there is ongoing research into southern flounder inlet use. And that is it for inlet quarters, and now I will turn it back over to Mike to talk about adaptive management. Thank you, Ann. So the next issue paper that we'll touch on is adaptive management, which is Appendix 4.4 to the FMP. And this uh, would be used to implement many of the measures discussed previously, particularly in sustainable harvest and increased rec access. 
For those unfamiliar with adaptive management, it's an optional framework that allows for specific management changes to be implemented between fishery management plan reviews, which provides flexibility for incorporating new data or information. The framework helps to define the when, the what, and the how. Um, it is important to, uh, to remember to realize that if these measures are not included in adaptive management or the framework is not adopted, management concerning these measures becomes etched in stone or static, and the flexibility to respond to changes in the fishery is lost. For example, if adapt adaptive management is approved, the starting dates for the commercial fishery can be altered from year to year, or if adaptive management is not selected, the starting dates will become static from year to year. Additional details of adaptive management can be found beginning on page 131 of the draft FMP. Because this is a framework, there are two options. These options, as well as specific actions that could be included under adaptive management can be found on page 10 of the decision document. The division's recommendation recommends uh, adopting this framework due to the additional flexibility it would provide for managing and maintaining the total allowable landings. And I'll turn it back to Ann to work through slot limit discussions. Thanks, Mike. So the next issue paper to discuss is the use of slot limits in the Southern Flounder Recreational Fishery, which is Appendix 4.6 to FMP. A slot limit allows a harvester to keep only fish that fall between a minimum and maximum size. The normally associated as a recreational management measure, slot limits can be applied to either sector. But the focus of this paper is the recreational hook and line fishery. Potential reasons or benefits to implement a slot limit for southern flounder center around the idea that a slot would help to increase escapement of the larger females. With the current options, most, if not all, fish released above the slot limit should be mature, though this would be dependent on the slot. 50% of female southern flounder are mature by 16 inches and 100% by 19 inches. The escapement of these larger, more fecund females may speed up recovery. However, it should be noted that escapement is already occurring due to the 72% reduction. So this would be in addition, in addition to the close to 1 million pounds already leaving the estuaries each year. Finally, the last benefit for the fishery would be that harvest of males could be increased if the lower end of the slot was dropped below the current minimum size. Dropping the minimum size limit though is not currently an option and this is explained in great detail in the issue paper. There are caveats to implementing the slot limit in the southern flounder fishery. Changes to sizes of fish harvested and released is expected as the stock recovers and the size structure increases in conjunction with seasonal closures that allow fish to grow prior to harvest. Changes can be seen in the figure to the left. The blue vertical bars show the percent frequency at length for 2017 and the orange bars show the percent frequency at length in 2020 for the recreational fishery. As you can see, the frequency of catches of smaller fish decreased while larger fish catches increased. Implementation of slot limits that would not uh, implementation of slot limits would not allow for increased harvest or extended seasons at this time and may add to increased dead discards and larger more fecund fish depending on the size of the slot selected. Limiting the harvest of flounder with a near, relatively narrow slot may help to constrain harvest and act as a buffer possibly preventing overages to the total allowable landings though. So these two figures show the harvest estimates for the 2008 to 2017 time period and the 20 and 2020 for the identified slot limit. The four and one fish bag limit are also presented. Additionally, the gray bars show what no slot limit during the season looked like. The three dashed horizontal lines are the varying allocations adopted by the MFC. So looking at the data for a 15 to 16 inch slot limit, which is the figure on the left, during the August 15th to September 30th season, the smaller slot meant harvest was reduced and therefore the likelihood of exceeding the tau is lower. You'll notice that landings within this slot vary, but only in 2013 at a four fish bag limit or the blue vertical bar, um, were there any of any of the approved total allow, allowable landings exceeded. This narrow slot did constrain landings when compared to no slot. 
The downside, though, is that this slot has the greatest potential to increase discard. When you look at the 15 to 19 inch slot, which is the figure on the right for the same season, harvest was greater than the smaller slot. However, the likelihood of exceeding the total allowable landings is much greater. There are five years where the total level landings were exceeded, and at least three years were at a one fish bag limit, which is the orange vertical bars. Changes to bag limits become more important as the slot size increases. When looking at the 2020 data, you can see that a 15 to 16 inch slot kept harvest below any of the approved total allowable landings. However, the 15 to 19 inch slot would only have acted as a buffer so that the overages would not have been as large. So, based on available data, there are five options presented in the paper, including four different slot options ranging from one inch to four inches. Options for slot limits can be found on page 10 of the decision document. The division's initial recommendation is status quo or do not implement a slot limit at this time and maintain the current 15 inch minimum size limit. Consideration of a slot limit would be more appropriate once the age and length structure of the stock expands and more data are available on the discarded fish. And now I will turn it back to Mike to talk about our last issue paper, which is phasing out the large mesh anchored gill nets. Thank you, Anne. So the final issue paper to present to y'all today is the phasing out of large mesh gill nets from the North Carolina Southern Flounder Fishery. This issue paper was developed at the request of the Marine Fisheries Commission. This issue paper provides information on the potential impacts of elimination of gill net from harvesting southern flounder. Phasing out of large mesh gill nets would provide increased protections to protected species, limit the cost of the gill net observer program, and may reduce user conflict. It is important to note that the fishery can be sustainable with or without large mesh gill nets. So that means that any harvest from gill nets can be absorbed by other mobile gears or pound nets. And it's unknown how Fisher's effort would shift both inside or outside of the flounder fishery if gill nets are phased out. The economic impact of phasing out the anchored large mesh gill net fishery is, is certainly difficult to quantify. The gill net fishery is the largest fishery targeting southern flounder of all gears in terms of number of participants and numbers of trips. If anchored large mesh gill nets are not allowed um, to harvest southern flounder, there will certainly be a negative economic impact to the, that user group. And what is unknown is how will fishermen adapt? Will they move to another gear or to another fishery to offset the loss? It must be noted here that because of Amendment 2 to the commercial uh, anchored large mesh gill net fishery, allowed yardage was reduced by 25% in all areas, and the fishery only operated for up to three weeks in 2020. Uh, there's two options to phase out anchored large mesh gill nets or to allow anchored large mesh gill nets. These options can be found on page 11 of the decision document. And it's important to note at this time that division does not have an initial recommendation for this option. And this completes our presentation on draft amendment three and the many issue papers. So returning to the timeline for a minute, at the next Marine Fisheries Commission meeting, which is scheduled for February of 2022, the MSC will receive an update on public comment and AC comments and recommendations and be asked to select the preferred management strategies. After selection of the MFC's preferred management strategies, they will vote to send draft amendment three to the DEQ secretary and legislative committee for review. In May of 2022, the MSC will receive department and legislative comments and be asked to vote on final adoption of amendment three. If the amendment is approved, management measures would be implemented by the Fisheries Director's Proclamation Authority following the May 2022 Commission meeting. Several options exist for the public to comment on this draft plan. The public can attend and provide public comment and at any of the three advisory committee meetings on the dates provided on the slide. They can submit written comments by U.S. mail, and certainly everybody can provide comments through our online Southern Flounder questionnaire. Thank you for your time. We look forward to completion of this amendment that includes recommendations for comprehensive long-term management strategies to rebuild the Southern Flounder stock. And at this time, Ann and I will be happy to answer any of the questions that you may have. And we'll turn it over to Laura Koblanski to work us through the questions. 
Thank you, Mike and Ann. So um, we have quite a few questions. Um, I do want to run through my opening remarks just one more time for those who joined us a little bit late. Um, and so just as a reminder, um, we are now going to be um, answering questions from attendees. If you would like to ask a question, we are going to be using the chat feature. So on the bottom right hand corner of your screen, you should see a chat button. If you click that, it will open a chat window and you can um, enter a question. We do ask that you enter it to everyone. I said all panelists before that was uh, misspoken. I should have said everyone. We have been copying those questions to the entire group to make sure that everyone can see them. Um, so uh, now, uh, if you do have a question, just type it in there. I'm going to read these and Mike and Ann are going to respond to those um, and we will get through as many as we can. We are going to have to um, have a hard stop at 3 o'clock. So we will answer as many as we can. If we don't get to your question, um, we will respond by email. And um, okay, so we'll get going. Um, and the first question that we had um, was from, let me see scroll up here. Um, the first questions that we had were from uh, Mr. Woody Joyner. And uh, his first question was, can we accurately predict recruitment out 10 years? And that was followed with, where did the requirements that regulations have to be in place for five years come from? And that was stated at the last NSC meeting. Okay, thank you, Laura. So the first part of that question was, can we predict recruitment out 10 years? And that's a great question. And what we used for recruitment was prior um, abundance levels of the Southern Founder stock. So we've got a long time series, um, uh, various abundance levels. And what we did was we looked at those abundance levels in the previous um, time series or the previous years, and we applied those as we felt the stock was going to in, in, improve. So our projections show an increase from 1,000 metric tons to 2,000 to 3,000 to 4,000 metric tons. And so what we did was as we moved to 2,000 metric tons, we looked at what the recruitment was in a prior year with comparable size in spawn and stock biomass and applied that recruitment value. So we stepped the recruitment up incrementally as the spawn and stock biomass is estimated to increase as time goes on. So that's the answer to the first question. The next question was, um, in reference to a five year um, deadline. And so I'm, I'm assuming that is speaking to the requirements of the Fisheries Reform Act. So based on adoption of Amendment 2 and the most recent stock assessment, we had a two year timeline to um, end over fishing. And then we had a 10 year time period to rebuild the spawn and stock biomass to a sustainable level. And the projections that we conducted and the levels of reduction will allow us to meet both that two year timeline and that 10 year timeline. Of course, the big assumption goes back to your first question, which is focused on recruitment. And the best that we can do is use those prior values of recruitment. We can't estimate exactly what mother nature is going to throw at us from year to year. So those recruitment values certainly can vary um, and we'll identify that when we update the stock assessment will include all that new information at the harvest levels that we're at. Hey, hey Mike. Yes, ma'am. Um, I think part of that question also was asking um, about why we're waiting five years until we do the next assessment. Oh, okay. So Thank you for the heads up on that. Yeah, I can touch on that. Um, and so the five year time frame for next stock assessment, the, the issue there is this is a coastwide stock assessment. So it includes North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and the state of Florida. So one of the big difficulties there is we certainly don't control what their agencies do. Um, we have a good relationship with them. We have um, um, many meetings throughout the year to find out what's going on with management and research um, for the species. There's new regulatory changes in North Carolina. There's regulatory changes that have just occurred this past year in South Carolina and in Florida. And many researchers suggest that a period of time from when a regulatory change occurs prior to um, conducting the next stock assessment so that we can evaluate the impacts of those regulatory changes. 
In addition to that, there's some ongoing research. We've got some satellite tagging research um, that's going on. We've got some acoustic tagging research that's getting at immigration rates and some other things that's currently ongoing. And South Carolina is also looking at um, some additional work on genetic analyses um, across the states. And so all of the states kind of agreed that it would be nice to have the results of those studies prior to starting the implementation of the next coastwide stock assessment. So given the, the duration of those studies and the recommendation of a four or five year period for management changes to the next stock assessment, that's where that five year time frame come in. And keep in mind that would typically be the start of the next stock assessment. And we all know that those can take some time, you know, up to two years or so. So it, to have the results in a peer reviewed stock assessment may be five to seven years um, down the road. Of course, that can all change based on um, discussions and recommendations from our Marine Fisheries Commissions as well as the other states. A lot of balls in the air. <laughs> so, um, Mike, um, so the next question is actually related to that. I'll go ahead and ask it. Um, it's from Michael Wayne, and he asked, when is the next stock assessment and what will the terminal year be? Yeah, it's a great question, Mike Wayne. I don't, you know, like I said, you know, we're looking at somewhere in the ballpark of, of five years from now. So we're 2022, so I would think somewhere 2026, 2027 would probably be the ballpark. And of course, I can't estimate what the terminal year that we would use in that stock assessment until we get the group together and identify where their data stands um, for each of those agencies. You know, if their age data are complete up to what year, their landings data, so on and so forth. Thanks, Mike. All right, so the next question is from Louis Daniel. How have projections presented been adjusted to account for overharvest and discards? Can you repeat that, Laura? Absolutely. How have projections presented been adjusted to account for overharvest and discards? So we have not think... updated the projections since we originally developed those at the end of the 2017 terminal year stock assessment. Um, we identified what the timeline was for uh, the projections through the 10 year time period. Yes, changes have occurred since then. And the only way we could update those projections now would be to update the stock assessment. Um, however, with that being said, the minimum to end over fishing in the two year time frame, which is where we're at now, was a 31% reduction in removals. And in year two, so in 2020, we we're at a 52% reduction. So we have exceeded uh, both in 2019 and 2020, the minimum to meet the ending of overfishing. Um, and like I stated earlier, when we get to um, the spawn and stock biomass recovery in 10 years, this was one of the reasons why we went with a greater reduction than necessary. So 52% reduction allowed the spawn and stock biomass to rebuild within that 10 year time frame. And what the commission approved, which is what we recommended, was a 72% reduction beginning in 20, um, 2020. And while we have not met 72%, the reductions we've achieved in year two were 52%, so they're meeting the minimum there. And we're hoping that the actions by the other states will also contribute to the recovery of the stock. Thanks, Mike. And then the second question um, from Louis Daniel is, how is escapement calculated? So what we were looking at with escapement is we're just relating what the harvest is, just like we do um, with uh, our projections or what we're looking at for our quota, and that's comparing it to the 2017 terminal year. So we looked at what the total removals were in 2017, and we compared the total removals um, to 2019 or 2020 and saw what the difference in those removals was, and that's the additional escapement that we're getting. Of course, we have not quantified what the actual escapement is, you know, while the fishery is occurring in all previous years, but we just have to make assumptions that because we've made savings, we've reduced our harvest compared to 2017, that there's additional volumes of escapement that's occurring out of our waters. Thanks, Mike. All right, so we have um, our next question is from Mark Cooper, and it is, what is your confidence level for recreational landing? 
Um, I think the confidence is high. We, as an agency within Marine Recreational in Information Program, we collect about four times the volume of data that most other states do. What Dr. Drew Cathy, our MRS expert, always tells me is that we uh, collect more in a two week period than most states do in a two month wave. Um, so that gives me confidence in those values for the recreational hook and line values. PSEs around those estimates are in the 20 to 30 range, which is good for um, MRIP estimates. In addition, we have uh, a mail survey for our recreational gig fishery, and we've got good precision around those estimates as well because we send that survey to such a high volume of participants in the gig fishery. Thanks, Mike. Okay, so our next question is um, from James Fletcher. And um, I actually spoke with Mr. Fletcher earlier today, and I believe you've spoken with him as well, Mike. So he put in um, quite a few questions. I am going to read them all, and then I think um, you can address them um, as you need to. So uh, Mr. Fletcher writes, um, is this the same Genesis fish as referenced in Yamaha Fishery Journal number 37, 1991? If so, why um, does the Southern Flounder Management incorporate large scale release of mostly female seed fish? Does management plan have any mention of maintenance of the fishing grounds? Who does plan account for dead discard during closed seasons? When uh, will ocean ranching in the sounds for Southern Flounder be discussed? Did Japan have the fishermen release the boff fish? Um, does the proposed plan suggest a hook size for recreational fisher, uh, fishing? Um, and could the SFFMP um, ever consider a total length retention for recreation like Japan utilizes? And when will a data reporting app for bluefin data be utilized? So I think that um, these are focused on um, perhaps a um, spawning program for Southern Flounder, which, uh, and Mike, remind me if I'm wrong, but so South Carolina um, is actually going to be developing um, a program. Is that true in their latest regulations? Yes, yeah, speaking to the stocking or hatchery work, um, yes, you're correct. The state of Texas has conducted stocking efforts um, and research for years and years and years along the Gulf Coast. Um, it is very expensive and it has not been very successful. Um, they have collaborated with the state of South Carolina. The South Carolina legislature has directed their agency to increase the fees of the recreational fishing license. Some of the proceeds from those increased in fees is to develop and expand the hatchery program that they have to include Southern Flounder. Their agency staff are working in conjunction with the staff in Texas to learn everything that they know um, and try to develop a sustainable hatchery program for Southern Flounder. Um, I believe, if my memory serves me correctly, they were tasked to begin releasing fish within, I think, five or six years from 2021. And South Carolina is certainly going to do their due diligence in identifying um, some of the issues um, that are inherent in stocking programs or looking at disease they're, of course, mainly focusing on the genetic integrity and the genetic stock identification of the Southern Flounder stock along the South Atlantic coast. So we have already begun uh, collaborating with them in South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida to collect adult spawning females, as well as juvenile fish beginning this spring to identify that genetic stock structure. Because there's always concerns um, when you incorporate hatchery release fish into a, a multi-state stock. And so those efforts are ongoing um, at their level. So time will tell how successful they are at growing out fish and at what's the appropriate stage to release those fish with the highest survival um, rate. And then I think the other part of the question there that maybe um, you could address is the um, the boss fish, which I believe is um, referring to larger fish being important to protect. Um, I don't remember what the uh, what that means, but it's something about very large fish being more fecund and wanting to protect them. So I think this refers to why are we not protecting the largest fish? Yeah, and that's a that's a good question. And in, in some sense, we are now that we've got a seventy two percent reduction. We've limited our seasons 
both recreational and commercially. Uh, we have not harvested the same level of fish the last couple of years we have in prior years. And it's likely that a lot of those fish that we didn't harvest were some of those large females that escaped to reproduce. Um, unfortunately, management um, actions in the state of North Carolina over the years for Southern Flounder has incrementally increased the um, minimum size limit from 11 inches to 13 inches to 14 inches to 15 inches. And that has certainly taken us away from a male female fishery um, to much more so dominated by a female fishery. Unfortunately, some of the information that we lacked our fecundity estimates for adult female southern flounder at varying life sizes, varying sizes. And that's information we're trying to um, get our hands on, right? We've got some estimates from hatchery reared fish, um, but those may or may not um, be comparable to wild stock fish. So we're investigating now trying to identify spawning grounds so that we can locate some of these big mature female fish um, on those spawning grounds to start collecting some of those data. So management cascades is, is, is part of the problem. Um, I think what we've done um, as we've increased size, in, in my opinion, is we have not really adjusted management, but we've kind of delayed harvest. So Southern flounder is a species of fish that grows rather quickly. Um, so within a given year from a year one fish to a year two fish, those fish can grow multiple inches. So when we increase our minimum size from 13 to 14 or 14 to 15, what we've done essentially is we've delayed the harvest of those same fish to later in the year. So a 14 inch fish caught in June and July is gonna turn into a 15 inch fish later that fall before it migrates out. Um, unintended consequences there for sure. Um, and the other issue is, you know, when we've gone up in size, we've also taken away some of the harvest of the potential harvest for males in the stock. Males certainly don't attain the larger size that the females do. And because of that, when we're up at a 15 inch size limit, very few males that we have attain 15 inches. So the vast majority of the harvest would be the females. You're muted, Laura. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> All right, our next question comes from Glenn Skinner. It is, um, are DMF staff concerned that recreational harvest overages and increased bed discards will jeopardize the long-term viability of the hook and line subsistence fishery um, if paybacks are adopted? Could you repeat that one more time, please? Absolutely. Are DMF staff concerned that recreational harvest overages and increased dead discards will jeopardize the long-term viability of the hook and line subsistence fishery if paybacks are adopted? Yeah, I don't know, Glenn, that's a great question. I'm not sure what the, the volume of the subsistence fishery is for the recreational component, right? I don't know how many people use um, hook and line for subsistence of, you know, capture Southern flounder for subsistence. But there is certainly concern about overages that occur in either the recreational and or commercial fishery, as well as any potential um, increase in discards. That certainly is a concern. And I think we show those concerns when we have these discussions and come up with recommendations that identify those concerns and where we can minimize um, some of those impacts. So going to a one fish bag limit, maintaining short seasons, you know, not implementing trip limits in the gillnet fishery. You know, we certainly take into account the potential for increasing discards um, wherever they arise. That's one of the reasons why when the division had discussions on slot limits, that was one of our concerns um, would be increasing discards of those larger fish, right? Some people say, well, if you're not keeping them, that's great. And the answer is you're absolutely right. But with a discard mortality rate of 9% on average, um, you know, some of those discards are gonna become mortality and that becomes waste. Um, so there's certainly a time and a place for some of these management regulations, but yes, there's always a concern um, when discards are increased. All right, so um, Glenn, I see you had two questions. I'm gonna try to get at least to one question from each attendee um, if we can before our time runs out. So I'm gonna skip your second question, but I'll come back to it um, as soon as we um, get past some of the others. So um, 
John de Personaire um, asked, when do you expect to be able to evaluate the outcome of the 2019 and 2020 catch reductions in regards to rebuilding process and ending overfishing? And also, are there uh, any other recreational data collection programs besides MREP that are available or in development that can assist with monitoring recreational southern flounder catch? Okay, great question. So. 2019 and 2020 uh, performance, we have evaluated that. Um, so for 2019, we uh, achieved a 35% reduction um, across the board for both commercial recreational fisheries combined, which was in excess of the 31% minimum to end overfishing with year one. Um, year two, so 2020, we achieved a 52% reduction in um, total removals. And so that was the minimum to begin rebuilding the spawn and stock biomass for that 10 year timeline. So the 52 and 35 were both over the minimum 31% um, required to end over fishing. So we have evaluated those. We have not got the numbers for 2021 yet to evaluate where we stand, but we're certainly on a good path. We have not met the minimum, the 72% we were shooting for, but as explained earlier, we selected a much higher value so that we would increase the likelihood of meeting the minimums, which was that 52%. And can you um, reiterate the second half of the question, Laura, please? Yes. Let me get back to it. Okay. It says also, are there any other recreational data collection programs? besides MREP that are available or in development that can assist with monitoring recreational Southern flounder catch? So we use another one for the recreational fishery. And again, that's a mail survey that we have um, through the coastal angling program that targets the recreational gig fishery. And so that's where our estimates for the recreational gig fishery come from. So those are not captured under MREP. Um, as far as other options, the division has certainly convened um, a work group to investigate some varying options that we can use, um, not only to um, look at data collection from an MRIP standpoint, but also to evaluate different ways that we maybe can get um, some more real time monitoring, whether that would be a, a call in system or some type of app. Um, but the development of those are certainly down the road, and there's nothing in place today, and there won't be anything in place probably next year. Um, that will get to the full magnitude of capturing the recreational fishery um, on a daily basis. But we are working in that direction, yes. All right. The next question comes from David Sneed, and it goes, has any consideration to protecting identified southern flounder nursery areas from shrimp trawls as identified by the P195 surveys? Um, through fisheries man or through this FMP for amendment 3, we, at this time, don't have any additional recommend recommendations on habitat. Um, protections for southern flounder um, habitat protections through the shrimp fishery management plan certainly account for some of the southern flounder bycatch that occurs, but we don't have any additional recommendations um, in southern flounder. Uh, amendment three for that now. All right. Um, and uh, one thing you referred to, Mike, is the habitat protections. Um, and I would like to point people, if they're interested, to the Coastal Habitat Protection Plan, which was just recently passed by the um, environmental, uh, the EMC, the CRC, and the MFC. Um, and we'll be uh, moving into the implementation phase. So I do encourage people to check out that plan. That is um, a comprehensive plan that looks at habitat protection and also water quality issues. All right, so our next question comes from Christopher Elkins. Um, it says more than half the commercial fishermen do not have trip tickets associated with their licenses, i.e. they either don't fish or they don't take their fish to be sold to fish dealers, hence their harvest is not reported. Moreover, a quota managed fishery would increase the non reporting so that the season could be prolonged. Thus, there is incentive to not report through fish houses. How is the division dealing with non reported harvest? 
Potentially, since the majority of fishermen are not reporting, more than half the commercial harvest could be missed naturally. This throws a monkey wrench in stock assessment models and management measures. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think that goes beyond the scope of Southern Flounder. So I would be happy to turn that one over to um, our section chief, Steve Poland, um, to maybe tackle that question. I was trying to get my. Actually, Mike, could you um, stop sharing your presentation before we move to so we can see your face? I'll let Mike work on that. Um, so yeah, Thank I mean, great, great question. As Mike said, that's um, you know a consideration not just for Southern Flounder, but you know, for all our fisheries. Um, you know, Southern Flounder will not be the first fishery that um, we potentially manage uh, with a quota. And we have other state managed fisheries that are managed at a quota, as well as numerous federal fisheries that um, you know we participate in. Um, really, it boils down to um, you know uh, level of enforcement, and I don't think we have anyone on here from Marine Patrol today, you know, that can speak to this. Um, but you know, really. Um, the way that you ensure that um, you know fish are reported is um, you know through enforcement um, measures, enforcement action. So enforcement um, at the fish house, enforcement you know on the water, and um, you know just ensure that those fish are you know making it to the fish house, or you know if someone is in possession of fish, they have the um, proper paperwork as far as um, you know a trip ticket or a bill of sale to you know actually accurately you know track those fish. So. Thanks, Steve. All right, so our next question comes from Joe, and I don't have a last name, but it says, "Is there any reason to not consider a reduced spot range as well as bag limit?" Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and you've done more work on this piece. Would you like to tackle this answer? Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, I can, and so you definitely could, and and MFC very well may do a slot limit as well as a reduced bag limit. Right now, the reason that the division is not recommending changing the size limit by doing a slot is for for the sheer fact that we we need some additional data, um, we need to know what the discards are going to look like. Um, the size demography is changing, the age structure is changing theoretically as um, the stock rebuilds. So we want to make sure everything's right before we actually implement a slot limit. Um, but it is it is not something that we're against. It's just something we want to kind of put on the back burner for the moment and then maybe address in amendment four. And I'm sure I missed something, Mike. So. Yeah, and I think part of that too is part, it, it seems part of the question was why didn't we do a slot recommendation under 15 inches? Um, and the answer to that is we're short on data. Um, so one thing Ember doesn't capture is the discarded fish in the fishery because the, the MRIP agents don't put their hands on those fish because they're released, they're not brought back to the dock. And as we've gone through size limit changes from 11 to 13 to 14, to now 15, we're years and years back before we would have um, comparable information on those less than 15 inch fish. However, as we mentioned in the presentation, we do have the development of that Catch You Later app and that app will allow us to get at some of that length information because that is one of the the um, data points we're asking for is a species ID as well as a length, and that will help get us to what the distribution of those discards are um, by length when they're under 15 inches. And we really need to have that information to make assumptions on what the fishery would look like as we lowered that size limit down. Now, it certainly does make sense um, in terms of of catch ratios between males and females to go to a smaller size. But at the smaller size, there's also a very high volume of fish, especially as SSB increases and recruitment increases through these protections, that that would be opening a very large um, contingent of the population to harvest. 
And so there's a lot of concerns there. So we need to really um, vet that information and dial into that information um, that we're, we're working on now prior to just jumping out and say, yes, let's lower that size limit. Okay, thanks, Mike. All right, our next question comes from Bill Gorham. And it um, he says, uh, he's asking, um, he, he's making a statement and asking for a response. So he says, if the stock abundance and angler success increase while participation remains the same, access will have to be decreased. Ultimately, this means the current management strategy and options as outlined with payback will eliminate the harvest of flounder in the recreational sector in the name of rebuilding the stock to a level never measured in history. Um, so yeah, as, as we um, improve the stock, the likelihood of an individual angler encountering more than one flounder certainly increases, right? And so, as Ann stated earlier, that's in the bag limit discussion. That's why the division's recommendation is to reduce that bag limit from four to one. And the reason we did we recommend that is it gets away that opportunity when the fish are available for any angler at any given time to harvest more than one. Right? We certainly anticipate um, an angler success increase, and we've seen that. We saw a little bit in 2019 landings data, we again saw it in the 2020 landings data that the success increased because abundance was there. And of course, that fluctuates from year to year to year. So that's why we're recommending these um, changes to bag limits. That's gonna help minimize those overages. And uh, certainly it's, it's hard to predict in any given year, as you can see from what we, what we saw in 2020 versus what we predicted based on previous angler behavior. Um, it's not always easy to do so, um, but paybacks will certainly have an impact um, and could have a uh, significant impact on the recreational side as well as the commercial side. Um, and that's the benefit on the commercial side with that daily reporting. And that's why I mentioned a little while ago that the division is looking at avenues to implement some type of daily reporting in the recreational sector to help minimize any overages that would occur. But to predict what those overages are going to be from year to year is certainly very difficult. Thanks, Mike. Okay, so our next question is from Anderson Tran, and they say, are there data on what percent of the tax dead discards make up, and is an estimation of post-release mortality accounted for in the tax? Yes, and I'm, I'm scrolling for some data. I don't know if I have it right here in front of me. <laughs> um, I was hoping I do, but the, the it, and it varies from, so we'll touch on the dead discards, that ratio. Um, and so for the, the commercial fishery, um, we're somewhere in the ballpark of about 4,000 pounds of dead discards um, in the large mesh gillnet fishery. Um, so that's a pretty small percentage. We're gonna have potentially have about 380,000 pound quota um, so 4,000 pounds of 380,000 pounds is, is a very small percentage. Um, it's a little bit higher on the recreational side. That's a difficult one again to look at because that changes based on fish availability from year to year. But I believe we estimated with the reductions and no changes to angler behavior. And remember, we have had changes. Um, we were looking at about, I think it was 12,000 pounds of dead discards in the recreational fishery. And that compares to about 152,000 pounds of quota. So a little bit less than 10% um, is dead discards. Now that certainly can dramatically change um, as people target southern flounder outside of the season that release those fish that succumb to release mortality that we capture through MRIP are absolutely included um, in the total allowable catch. So yes, those are added all together. And that's that's why when we do daily monitoring and we close the fishery, say on the commercial side. We shut it down. We don't have a, a total estimate until we include those dead discards. It's that total estimate, total allowable catch is what we base any overages on or any accountability measures on. You're muted, Laura. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. 
All right, our, ne our next question is from Ken Siegler, and um, he asks, what are the deep hooking mortality rates for southern flounder? Um, I don't have specifics on deep hooking mortality rates. Um, what we've used was a annual estimate um, of 9% for catch and release mortality from the recreational hook and line fishery. Um, and of course, that's going to vary throughout the months, you know, warmer months, you typically have higher release mortality, cooler months, you typically have lower release mortality. Um, but we used an annual estimate of 9% for this stock assessment for catch and release um, southern flounder. And I actually spoke with a gentleman today who offered some suggestions on what he had seen in his fishing group um, was less than that. But the way that the agency or researcher looks into this is not only do we look at just release mortality, which is I caught the fish, I let that fish go, did it swim away, did it not swim away? We also looked at delayed mortality, mor delayed mortality, which is up to about a 72 hour time period. So just because a released uh, hook and line captured released southern flounder swims away, certainly they don't all survive. And sometimes it's 24 hours or 48 hours or even up to 70 hours or so after capture and release that they could succumb to stress and mortality. Um, so again, the value that we use for this stock assessment was 9%. All right, so um, I skipped a few people who had multiple questions. So I'm gonna start going through that list again and we'll, um, we have 20 more minutes. So um, our next question is from Glenn Skinner. And he asked, um, will the change in sector allocations adopted by the NSC jeopardize the long-term viability of the pound net fishery? Um, they, they certainly could. And so that was the reason why the division looked at um, the sub allocations within the um, sustainable harvest issue paper. And so what we looked at is how can we accommodate those changes over the coming years. And so we looked at it, as I mentioned, in, in a couple different ways. We looked at it and said, okay, you know, the commercial fishery is going to reduce from 390 ish thousand pounds to 266,000 pounds by 2024. So if that allocation of the commercial industry is 266,000 pounds, then the pound net fishery, based on what we currently see, they're about 50% of the harvest would only be 133,000 pounds. So that potentially could jeopardize the long-term viability of the pound net fishery. Um, the division worked with the Southern Founder Advisory Committee to develop a lot of these recommendations. We had discussion on options of what industry um, would be interested in for the pound net fishery. And so the division came up with a couple other options. One option is to maintain the pound net allocation or the pound net sub allocation to what it is today. And that's about 186,000 pounds. So you can see that's about a 50,000 pound difference between those two options for just that pound net fishery. But what that does is if we allow the pound net fishery that higher allocation of 186,000 pounds, that only leaves about 80,000 pounds for the other gears. So gigs and gill nets and, and the other gears that land Southern Flounder. The third option of that was something that was brought to, to us by the Marine Fisheries Commission. And that was the idea of potentially phasing out the anchored large mesh gillnet fishery from harvesting southern flounder. So what we did there was we took that harvest, and I don't remember what the value was right off the top of my head. It was a hundred and some thousand pounds. And we divided that harvest amongst the gig fishery and the remaining um, mobile gears. And we took the other half and gave it to pound nets. And in fact, if we did that, then in year 2024, at a 60-40 allocation, the pound nets had about a 220,000 pound um, sub allocation. And then by 2024, at a 50-50 allocation, they were down to about 180,000 pound allocation. So those are the, the three ways we looked at it. There was certainly concern expressed by the pound net industry through the Southern Founder Advisory Committee that yes, if their volume of harvest availability was reduced much below where it currently is, that that would jeopardize many individuals in the pound net fishery. Um, and I'd just like to follow up on that with, you know, just the regulatory changes that occurred in 2019 and 2020 with the shortened window, that there were a number of pound net fishermen who don't set any of their pound nets anymore. Um, and there's a very large contingent of pound net fishermen who are only set setting a subset 
of the nets that they actually have um, permits for. And so those two actions have actually brought down the harvest um, from the pound net fishery. All right. Let's see, going down the list, next we have Mark Cooper, and he asks, does DMS agree with the decision to reallocate from 70-30 to 50-50 commercial rec? Um, that's 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 a, a decision that was made by the Marine Fisheries Commission. They instructed us to uh, implement those allocations, and we will certainly do as they directed us to do on that. And Steve, I see your camera popped on. Would you like to add to that, or are you good? No, I don't have much more to add. Um, Mike covered it. Yeah, just stating that you know, it's not. It wasn't a biological decision. It didn't affect the sustainability of the stock and that falls squarely within the purview of uh, the marine fisheries um, commission as far as you know it's it's up to them on how to allocate the resource um, to the various sectors um, so that's why the division did not provide a recommendation on the allocation issue all right, thank you. And we're going to move on to the second question that we got from Michael Wayne. He asked, will accountability measures for the rec sector use a rolling three year uh, average like is used by the MA, uh, the Mid Atlantic Fishery Management Council for summer flounder to account for uncertainty of NREP data? Um, at this stage in the process for that question, the answer is no. And the reason the answer is no is. Yes, there's more uncertainty around a point estimate from MRIP than it would be around a three year average. Unfortunately, we also have to take into consideration the FRA of 97 and our rebuilding schedule. Um, so what, what that means is we could not afford to allow overages to occur in the recreational fishery for three years from now or three years from implementation of a quota, if that's the direction it goes prior to having any paybacks, right? We just couldn't afford that um, at this time. So what data we have to accommodate is the point estimate from Emory. All right. Now we have our second question from David Sneed. And if you will bear with me, I'm going to be scrolling. All right, he said, um, follow up on the nursery areas. Um, that was from his question before. Uh, my question goes to the effort to rebuild Southern Flounder. If you have identified the nursery areas, did I skip? I think I skipped maybe one of his. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm going to go back to the top. Um, it says, would the phase out of large mesh gill nets impact? Nope. No, I'm lost. Okay, here it is. <laughs> I apologize. Follow up on the nursery areas. So my question goes to the effort to rebuild Southern Flounder. If you have identified the nursery areas for Southern Flounder and you are attempting to recover the stock, would it not make sense to restrict fish, uh, shrimp trawling in that area to reduce the bycatch impact on the stock? It seems logical that protection of the nursery area would be paramount to rebuilding the stock. Yeah, it certainly is. And, and there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes, not directly related to the Southern Flounder Fishery Management Plan. Um, there's research that's evaluating the nursery areas um, and designating nominated SHAs um, that would be additional protections through the prior shrimp plan in 2006, the Noose River, the Pungo River, the Pamico River, um, all had lines changed to protect and reduce Southern flounder catches, so that that's occurred, um, and you know we're still working on nursery areas. You know that research is ongoing. So just because it's not been um, addressed through this particular fishery management plan doesn't mean that's not anything we're concerned with and aren't trying to attain the data we need to move forward with additional protections. And then uh, we have a second question from Bill Gorham. It says. Is it false to say either there must be a large reduction in participation in this fishery and or the stock must decline or remain the same in order for any hope to stay within the tax? No, I don't think so. Um, I think we'll certainly have 
of greater struggle maintaining the recreational fishery to the total allowable catch. Um, I think we've done well the last two years for the commercial fishery. Um, again, they met about a 62% reduction, maybe a little bit more um, with just the seasonal approach, and that's not through daily quota monitoring. Um, so I think on the commercial side, when if, if uh, quota is implemented, then we certainly can do daily quota monitoring. I think we can get that down uh, their harvest to the 70% level. Um, the recreational side, that's certainly going to be um, a bit more challenging, and we may struggle with that until we come up with a way to implement some type of daily monitoring in that fishery as well. Um, but again, you know, we can reduce down to a one fish bag limit. The things that's going to happen is if we're at 152,000 pounds or so of quota, if we impl if the commission implements a quota in 2023, that's going to bump up to about 180, 190,000 pounds of quota. And then by 2024, when we go to a 50-50 allocation, um, that's gonna give the recreational sector about 266,000 pounds. Um, so our thoughts are that a one fish bag limit with a constrained season meets the requirements for um, rebuilding. So yes, but I would hope that the public is aware of actions from you know targeting flounder outside of the season and the impacts of those dead discards have on the tack and that we can minimize that that type of fishing pressure as much as possible all right and then we had um one last question come in um and that was from tim Geswicky. And his question is, is it 52% or 72% reduction that must be achieved to reach the statutory target spawning potential ratio by 2028? Um, and then he has a second part, which is what SPR will be achieved by 2028 at a 52% reduction? Um, so the answer is based on the FRA to meet sustainability requirements for spawn and stock biomass a 52% reduction takes us to the threshold. The threshold is the minimum spawn and stock biomass that's required to have a rebuilt fishery. So if memory serves me right, that's in the 4,000 metric ton um, range. A 72% reduction is what the commission approved and the division recommended. And again, the reason we, we went for a 72% reduction was to offset some of that uncertainty. Aim for a higher number, and if it comes in a little under 72%, we still have met that minimum minimum rebuilding for 2028. And what was the second half of that question, Laura? Absolutely. It was what SPR will be achieved by 2028 at a 52% reduction, which I think you sort of answered. It'll be the threshold. Is that correct? Um, I don't correct. know if you have the exact values. I think it, mm, no, I don't have the exact value in front of me. Um, I believe it was an SPR of 25%, uh, SPR of 35%, I believe is what it was, but I don't have that number in front of me. Okay. All right. We've had another question come in um, from James Fletcher. He asks, um, does one fish bag limit encourage high grading to largest fish, um, and does that equal more dead discards? Yeah, and I think... I've been told by the public in, in a public forum that, yes, it's going to encourage high grading. Um, but I don't know how you can allow two fish because we're concerned about high grading. I think those individuals that are going to abide by the regulations that are implemented will have their one fish and they're going to move on. Those that don't abide by the regulations, it's not going to matter if we tell them one fish or two fish or three fish. They're going to catch and keep what they want to keep, and that'll be up to Marine Patrol um, to enforce. Um, and that's the difficulties with a lot of this is those adjustments to angler behavior. And some of those things cannot be accounted for with our estimates. Um, a one fish bag limit certainly um, gives this fishery management plan the greatest likelihood of succeeding in meeting those rebuilding requirements. And beyond that, what, what individuals choose to do in response to the regulations, you know, we can't really control that. Um, Marine Patrol certainly can enforce it though. And we would not encourage high grading by any means, right? We would not encourage that whatsoever. All right, thanks, Mike. So I'm not seeing any other questions come in. Um, 
I'll give it just another couple of seconds. All right, so I think we're ready to wrap up. Um, thank you, Mike and Ann, for um, submitting yourself <laughs> to <laughs> question and answer session. And um, I would like to thank all of the attendees um, today. We really appreciate that you have um, gotten on here to participate. We value your input and we look forward to hearing from you during this public comment period. Um, just to reiterate, this is not a public comment session, it's just learning and engaging. Um, so. If you would like to provide public comment on the Southern Flounder Amendment 3, please do so um, via either US mail to the Marine Fishery Commission office. There's an online forum, or you could submit um, spoken comment either at the advisory committee meetings next week or at the Marine Fishery Commission meeting in February. Um, and with that, I will say goodbye. Thank you. Thank you all.